Hey, this is Latif Mikado, and you're listening to the Good Night Freestyle Podcast, where I take some time each night to try and reflect on the freestyle scene, where it is, where it's going, and try to figure out how to sustain it, not just for future generations to enjoy, but also to benefit. So sit back, relax, and let's talk some freestyle. Hey, what's up, everyone? It's Latif, and welcome to the Good Night Freestyle Podcast. And this is episode number 39. It is Saturday night, just chilling out, watching some movies. Um, uh, check that, I just watched that movie, Honey Boy, with that, what's his name? Is it Shay? Shay LeBeau? Yeah, um, pretty interesting story, kind of bugged out. It's crazy the way, you know, some people were raised... You know, sometimes we we complain about our situations and uh, then we look at situations of, of other people, even though, you know, he ended up later on uh, getting into acting and, well, he's, he was acting like it since he was a kid, but uh, it seemed to, it was, it was a rough situation, man, but um, to persevere through those types of um, um, circumstances is really... It makes an incredible person, man. I really, I really believe that. Um, I also watch um, the podcast, uh, Mike Tyson's podcast. I check that out quite a bit. I'm actually, I geek out on that one. I, I really love it. Um, I met Tyson a couple of times. He'll never remember me because I met him uh, one time um, at the Motown Cafe. I was with Ernest Thomas Raj from What's Happening, who's a really good f- friend of mine for many years. One of my best friends, actually. Um, and I met him in the Motown. I met uh, Tyson at the Motown Cafe. Um, and then I met him another time. Um, I used to, where was I coming out of? I was coming out of some hotel in Manhattan. I forgot I had to, I had to go see somebody. I forgot what it was, probably one of the labels. I don't remember, it was years ago. And um, Tyson was outside. I think it was right after he um, went to prison. Uh, when he got out. So it has to be like, what, 95? I think he came out. Um, the other time I saw him, I saw him with Robin Givens uh, going through the airport with the whole entourage. Um, I had just come home from prison myself during that time, and uh, I actually got a job at um, LaGuardia Airport, which was so crazy. Um, <laughs> I worked security. You know, what was so crazy is that you know, I went to prison for uh, drugs for sales. Um, and when you go, when you do anything like that, especially when it comes to drugs, you know, the last place they want you is working the security checkpoint in a, in an airport. But um, I had no choice, man. I was like up against the wall, and I had to get a job. And I was already a persistent felon. So you're talking about three. I was on my third felony, um, all for the same shit, same bullshit. Um, went in young, came out young. I, I did finish my last bill when I was like 24, 23, about 23 years old. Never went back. I don't mess around on with nothing. So, um, but I remember being on the security checkpoint. I saw you know, everybody's head start turning. And when I turned, it was Tyson with his, his wife and, well, his ex-wife, Robin. I don't even think he likes to acknowledge that, that lady. I don't know. I don't know his story when it comes to that. But, um, you know, you see him now, uh, he has the Tyson Ranch, so, you know, he's growing marijuana, he has like a whole, man, he has a, like a whole facility uh, around it, it's really, really impressive, and I was always a fan, I was a fan of him back in the day, and um, I think I'm even a more, more of a fan now, uh, because I, I hear him talk, and I see where his head is, and he really is not happy with who he once was, he talks about that a lot. You know, so, um, but it's really interesting um, situation that he's in now. But yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. I was a, like I said, I was a fan back then. I'm a, even more of a fan now, because uh, he had a rough man. He, you know, his support system as a kid was kind of weak. Um, you know, I don't know too much about his, you know, his family life growing up. I know when he got older, and he got with Cus, who was his trainer, and. 
that was became a hole and I think that's where all the changes started to be you know happen well not really the changes that's where he became a champ this is where he strived to be a champ it didn't really change him because he was uh he was kind of he was kind of off the hook you know uh but a lot of people fell in love with him because of that you know um you know it just <laughs> humans are just weird man the, the stuff that we are uh, that we go for that we fall for you know um I love to to hear about adversity and then people kind of climbing out of the trenches. I've always been fascinated by that. Um, I got tons and tons of books. I read. I love documentaries. People don't like to watch TV with me <laughs> because I, I, that's the kind of stuff I, I geek out on, man. Documentaries and those rags to riches stories and. Uh, it doesn't even have to be rags to riches. It could be rags to riches, back to rags. And things are just impressive. It's not all about money for me. It's the journey. It's about what you what you, what you, you collect and what kind of legacy. And can you touch people? Do you touch people in any way? This, I think that's my, the, for me at least, that's probably what I would consider success in my own mind. You know, some people think, oh, if I have a car. I, there was a time I, I would say freedom, but I've had freedom for quite a bit. I, I've, I've, been, I've had the freedom to pretty much do whatever the hell I want to do for many years, since, God, at least, uh, at least 30 years. So if I don't want to work tomorrow, I don't have to work. If I want to jump on a plane, go to California tomorrow, I actually could. If I want to jump on a cruise and take a two-week vacation, I could do that too if I want to. You know, buy something extravagant. Um, I'll think twice about it, but I could probably do it. Not off the wall extravagant, but ex- more extravagant than the average folk. So, so you know, and that's the free- that's what I mean. I used to mean by freedom, but that doesn't really even apply because when I used to say freedom, I w- what I wasn't realizing is that I kind of had that already. I could scale it. I could make it where. Um, I could do it more often or whatever the case may be. But then as I um, I continued on, um, there was something else that I wanted. And I kept trying to figure out, I kept trying to figure out what that was. What is it that I'm, I'm looking for? What will define my own personal success? Now, for other people, it might be buying a home for their mother, taking a trip around the world, putting their kids in the best schools, paying off their bills. Um traveling the world doing buying whatever the hell you want to buy um and those yeah those are great <laughs> um definitions of success for different people mine has now come to a whole other realm is it real or is it realm I think it's realm if my wife was here she would correct me <laughs> she says how the hell do you write you know i can write i can write i can write pretty well Sometimes I, promo- I pronounce shit, man, I mess it up. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so I've gotten to the point where now it seems like success to me is can I touch somebody? I know it sounds weird. It, sound, it could sound pretty, uh, yeah, pretty weird. But um, yeah, can I touch someone? Can, with my art, with my art, or with my words, can I touch somebody with this podcast? You know, I mean, I'm doing this every single day. I'm at number 39, episode 39. How many episodes are going to touch before I finally touch someone? I don't know. Might be 7,000. Who knows? Um, my books, how many books do I have to read, do I have to write to touch someone? Now, I know with, with um, my first book, Freestyle for Life, I got a, a lot of great um, reviews and I got a lot of great a lot of calls and emails and people. I know I touched several people with those books, with that book in particular. Um, so I'm cool with that. Uh, that was good. When I did Feast Out, I don't know if I touched anybody, but that was an experimental project there. I was basically writing something that I wanted to write. I had a desire to write, but I wasn't too familiar with that genre, which was like, <coughs> excuse me, like the horror <clears throat> horror vampire uh, drama. Hold on, let me get some water here. 
Um, um, <clears throat> yeah, but now, and then how about my vlogs, my video vlogs? Like, I've had people, you know, talk to me about that and uh, give me props on it. Uh, my freestyle against phonies, my, my, um, the groups I've had people who have, I know I've touched, you know, and I think those are the, the, the parts of the success. It doesn't have to be a lot of people. It could be one, maybe two people. Um, I don't know if these podcasts have touched anybody yet. You know, I, I, I'm not rushing it. Like I said, maybe it'll take uh, episode 30, uh, 7,000. Who knows? Um, they touch me. I think that's that's probably the first step, actually. So, because you can't really do anything and have any kind of you know come across sincere unless it first touches you. If you're if you're doing stuff just because it's a formula or because the next man is doing it, I don't think you're gonna I don't think you're gonna succeed. Same thing with a, a songwriter or an artist. You can't wake up one morning and say, "I want to write a song." What's the formula? Let me you know what I'm saying it. You know, art, that kind of art has to come from really, really way deep down inside. And it has to come across. It really does. So I think that goes with all kinds of art. Everything from fashion uh, to, you know, recording artists, singers, dancers, you know, um, filmmakers, actors, painters, sketch drawers, people who draw um architects so yeah you know I, those are those are those are so those are art that's art and um that has to come for it to be true art it has to come from deep inside because you can look at a painting and you look at it and you look at that shit and say man that shit look like scribble scrabble I can do that I can do it but you see people stand in front of that painting for hours and they're staring at that painting. And you're looking at it. And you're like, what the, hell, what the hell are they looking at? You know, it's like, it, this dude looked like he took his freaking finger and just kind of smeared the whole, you know, it's weird. But then you try to go and do it. And you can't. You cannot do it. You can try to mimic that painting to a T. You're not going to do it. It's art. You're not, because it's not coming from inside. You're trying to look at this other painting and you're trying to copy it. It's not going to come across. People are not going to stand in front of your painting for hours on end. These other painters, those paintings meant something. There was something about the brush strokes, all the finger strokes, all the colors, all the layers of colors, all the swishes, or the lines within the brush strokes. I mean, there's, there's something in there that has them, you know, doing this, you know, painting this way. So when someone just picks up a brush, they say, oh, I could do that scribble, scrabble. Mm. Nah, man, doesn't come across. It really doesn't. Just like someone who, you know, who sings songs, even if you didn't write them. You know, even though you might be able to sing, are you an artist? You've... You've, many of us have, have seen the difference. We've seen people, and you see that, you know, I've seen that in church. Well, mm, not really in church. I'm trying to think where I would see it. Maybe like music class. How's that? Where teachers are really talented. They're really good at what they do. And they can tell you the, they can teach you the, 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 the interest, what's it called, intricities, the intric, intricities, or intri, you know what I'm saying, the intric, intricities, or whatever the hell you say, I'm saying it wrong. Um, intricate, that, those intricate details, they can break it down to you and really make it make sense, but when they go and try to play it, they don't captivate you because it's not in their soul. They learned it, it's a formula to them, you know, and they can't. But they can't project it. They can't. They can't deliver it. They can create it, but they can't deliver it. They can't. They can deliver it to your ears. They can't deliver it to your heart. If you think of any artist, an actor, when you fall in love with actors, it's because they touched you, man. If you 
watch a play or a movie and it makes you cry. Those people touched you. You know, it happens with opera singers. Sometimes these people don't even know what language they're singing in. And it's singing in Italian and they touch them. And the next thing you know, you see people, you know, tears are coming or dropping because they don't need to understand. There's something being delivered to the soul. The soul understands it. The soul understands it. And that's why it's reacting the way it's, it is, you, you know. But your mind might be a little limited. So you won't, you won't really get it. You won't understand it. So... But, you know, so, yeah, so that's, that's pretty much just, that's, that's how I see it, you know. So when it comes to, you know, freedom, what, I mean to um, success, what success to me is being able to touch you, being able to touch generations after I'm gone. See, that's powerful. That's power. That's, that's like being immortal. Think about this. Think about you know how many times I've read books and I just get hooked on an author only to find out that he died years ago. Whew, wow. Because he lived for those several days that I took to read the book. He lived. He lived there. You know, I understood his writing. I the, the journey that he took me on, it took me by the hand. Then you find out that he's he or she is dead. That's crazy. That's crazy. Or like you, um, you start to, uh, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Donald Goins. If you don't, are not familiar with Donald Goins, you might want to check him out. So Donald Goins was an author, a writer in the 70s. He wrote a lot of his books and they were street lit, man. They were urban, but they were urban novels before anybody knew what urban novels were. They were straight up street literature. These things were like, <laughs> they were gritty, man. He was a junkie, and he did time in prison. Matter of fact, he wrote a lot of his stories in prison. And I read one book. I forgot where I got the book from. I read one, and it wasn't that it was so magnificent as far as you know, as far as the um, the cleverness of the writing. What captured me was there was no cleverness. He was just telling his story, man. He was telling his story as straight as he possibly could. And he ended up with an entire series. I went and bought all his books. I read one and I got hooked. That's how I started to study the guy. And I went online and tried to learn about him. I saw documentaries and I saw, you know, people, interviews that they talked about him. And I, and I became this... um. I became a fan and I just had to buy all his books. Like I had to, think about that. The guy's been dead for years. I think he died in the, God, did he die in the seventies? I don't, I knew his whole story. It's just been years, so I forgot. Um, but his name is Donald Goins. You guys might want to just Google that and uh, tell me what you find. Let me know. Um, but um, real straight up gritty, like he had the ability to really put you in the spot whatever was happening if they were sitting in a living room shooting dope so were you damn so look at this legacy here so the guy is dead but I'm reading his words now like several years you know maybe a couple decades after he's already been gone now what happens in the next 20-30 years when maybe my grandkids are doing some research research and maybe they go under urban literature or whatever or urban novels or whatever and they find my books because my books are urban they're urban latino um only because i use latin um characters in my in my books but they go in there and they find the donald going stuff so now you have a new generation two three generations later who have now become fans of this author who has been dead for so many years you know so and going back to just so, to be clear here, because um, people have asked me in the, in the past, yeah, my books are urban Latino, and I'll tell you why. Okay, I could just call it an urban novel, but urban novels have always been attributed to black families, black black culture, African American culture from the ghettos, whether it's New York, Chicago, Detroit, wherever. 
LA, Camp, Compton, and so on, okay? Now, I, I grew up in the ghettos of the Bronx, tenements in Plint, on Plinton Avenue, Soundview Projects, um, and then in Queens, it was a little, little cleaner. But when I lived on Plinton Avenue, which was between Ogden and Nelson, I believe, I went to PS11, I don't know if anybody, or CES11, I think that's what it was called, on Ogden Avenue, if any of you guys are familiar with the elementary school, that was my school. Also, I went to um, uh, 126, well, I believe that's a PS, right? Don't remember, anyway, PS, or is that a CES 126? I don't remember. Anyway, so, but check this out. Okay, so I lived on a block that was predominantly black in Puerto Rican. Now, we all lived under the same circumstances. We did. Okay? Some of us lived right next door to each other. Okay? Which meant that our living situations were more or less, more or less the same. You know, we, took, we all had different values. Doesn't mean one was good, one was bad. No, this just different. It's just different. Um, but you see, and though I spent a lot of time with my friends my black friends in their, with their families. I ate dinners with them. I've slept over. I understood. But then when I went home, it was a different, there was different things about it. The food was different. We said bendition before we went to sleep and shit like that. We always kissed our, our, our mother. My friend didn't. I know others that did. My friend didn't though. He didn't kiss his mother all the time. I don't think I've ever seen him kiss his mother. I know he loved her. That didn't take that. I wasn't there. I knew there was no loss of love. It was just they, they just they they um they showed differently. So I was accustomed to Latino living, man. The, the foods I ate, the things we said, the type of celebrations we had, the type of clothes we wore, um, and um, the music that we listened to. So it was easier for me to write stories based on what I was familiar with. I didn't, want to, I didn't want to go and start writing about what my neighbor and how he was living. Though I could have done it. I could have done it. I read enough urban novels to get a really good feeling. Like I said, it's really not that different. But why? Why should I? Why should I? I have stories that began with, you know, my characters were black, African-American, but and ended up becoming Puerto Rican. Because I was like, why? Not for no reason. There's a lot of urban novels with, with black characters, a lot. And there was there's superheroes and everything. We don't have that many. So let, let me, I'm gonna contribute, <laughs> you know? Give people a different perspective, give them something different. And that's another reason why a lot of my books have freestyle in it. Because all these other books have, you know, hip hop. They have a, a hip hop background. Not that they're about hip hop. You see, that's the thing with my books. I don't want them to be about freestyle. I just want freestyle to be like that theme, that 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 background curtain. You know what I'm saying? That backdrop. I just want that to be it. So I don't want my books to all be about freestyle, and they're really not. Freestyle for life is not actually about freestyle per se, but it's about a situation involving freestyle. You need to check that book out. Uh, freestyle, same thing. It's not really about freestyle, but it has, it's wrapped around freestyle. Okay? Uh, yes, yes, y'all. It's straight up hip hop, but you're going to find some freestyle in there also. But see, there's other stories. Those are just subplots. There's also a main plot. There's a plot that runs from A to Z. But then there's an underlying plot, which is where the music comes in and stuff like that. But I don't go into the music and I don't, I'm, I'm re- I touch, I think I touched on those things pretty light, you know? So um, I might bring up some references when it comes to radio stations or clubs or certain artists, you know? But that's because, you know, I just add those in. But, um, but yeah, so anyway. All right, guys, I just want to uh, to speak to you a little bit about that. I hope you guys are having a great night. It's Saturday night. I'm chilling. I'm just watching movies. I'm actually watching the Malcolm X, um, Who Shot, Who Killed Malcolm X, the documentary. It's a docu-series. You might want to check that one out, too. Really good. Um, I know a lot about the history of Malcolm X. Um, I knew one of his daughters, Malika. Um, and uh, I'm a huge fan of Malcolm from back from the nation all the way until he accepted Islam. Um, 
but we'll talk about it in another, uh, in another podcast. How's that? All right. So, all right, guys. So, listen, man. Have a good night. Be safe. Don't drink and drive. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. And until tomorrow, good night, freestyle. Before I lay me down to sleep, I pray to hear a freestyle beat. For if I die before I wake, I hope to make it to the break.